But we begin this morning with W.T. Cosgrave, an unlikely leader of an Irish government, but thrust into leadership after the deaths in quick succession of Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins. Cosgrave himself died just 50 years ago, tomorrow. Brian Farrell's broadcast at his state funeral in 1965. On a wet, grey morning in this small parish church of the Annunciation in the village of Rathfarnham, a crowded congregation, the leaders of church and state, the leaders of the profession, representatives of Dublin Corporation, and men and women from every walk of life have gathered to give homage as a community to the memory of William Cosgrave, because today the Irish state honours one of its greatest architects and creators. I have just tendered to His Excellency the Governor-General advice to dissolve the electors. W.T. Cosgrave announcing the 1932 general election. He was not to know it then, but he would never lead an Irish government again. I think in any assessment you look at the monuments that were left behind. But he had already made his impact. He had been president of the Executive Council of the Irish Free State from 1922 to 1932. Maurice Manning. It was under his leadership that the institutions which have survived to this day were founded and they have found that they've proved durable. Uh, the whole tradition of honest administration and incorruptible civil service, uh, the, the army loyal to the civil arm, all of these things happened. Courage, rectitude, simplicity. Richard Mulcahy on Cosgrave's attributes. Good humour, honesty, fearlessness. And he showed that on very many occasions. A more aggressive man at the head of the government during the Civil War. Another cabinet colleague, Ernest Blythe. Might have split it, whereas Cosgrave actually welded it together. He found compromises when compromises had to be found, and he was a forward-looking man. And I think fair play was the keynote of his whole character and his whole career. Michael Hayes. He was a passionate believer injustice for all our citizens. I never found Richard Mulcahy anything in him that didn't show that he was fearless in standing for the things that require to be stood for in Ireland so that Irish work might go on. I suppose the most striking qualities that I recall in Mr. Cosgrave James Dillon were wisdom and integrity. I came to work with him in early in 1919 after Sinn Féin had won the general election that year and Dáil Éireann had been established. Ernest Blythe. Uh, uh, the Dáil met in January, I think. I didn't come along till March because I was in Belfast jail. The government was already formed, but after a few days, Mr. De Valera added me as an extra minister and I began to attend meetings and meet Mr. Cosgrave whom I knew of course before that as a man who'd fought in 1916 and as one of the early Sinn Féin members of the corporation and a man who was a bit more a little bit older than the, most of us and a good deal more experienced because we were beginners in public affairs. Next from the archives this question why W.T. Cosgrave. Why in the aftermath of the death of Arthur Griffith and the assassination of Michael Collins in August 1922, just as the Civil War began, did his colleagues turn to W.T. Cosgrave as leader? The question here is put to five historians by Andy O'Mahony. John M. Regan, Morris Manning, Eunan O'Halpin, Mary Daly and first Tom Garvin. Was Cosgrave the inevitable choice? No, not really. Uh, the Free State coming into being had a lot of very strong leaders, among them Cosgrave himself and, of course, General Mulcahy and uh, very obviously, of course, Kevin O'Higgins. However, on the other hand, he was the man who, in the Cabinet, had the swing vote in favour of the Treaty. And he was the person who in many ways was a hinge of the old Doyle government under the first and second Doyles because he was Minister for Local Government, which is going to be uh, absolutely vital in the first years of the Free State as the Free State tried to control the territory it had been given under the treaty. An automatic choice, Mary Daly. 
Well, I think if you went on a seniority principle, yes, because if you go to the, if you look at the seven people who who ultimately decided in cabinet, on, you know, in early in, in in 1921 on the treaty, he's the last survivor of them that stage. The others are either anti-treaty or dead. So, mm. in that sense, he he becomes a critical figure. Morris well, Manning. There was no automatic choice because the death of Collins was so unexpected. So nobody had been preparing. There was no leader in waiting. Uh, and Cosgrave, in many ways, would have been an unlikely person to follow Collins because, he, whereas Collins was flamboyant and colourful and all of that, Cosgrave was almost the opposite. Yet, once the vacancy was there, there was surprisingly little uh, talk of a contest. He did emerge very, very quickly and with very little opposition. So, not automatic, but once people thought about it... Wasn't uh, Dick McGahey in the frame? Uh, Mackay was in the frame, but mm. I think what Cosgrave, in a sense, brought to the job, I know there's a danger of reading backwards about this, was, in a sense, that sense of being a competent chairman rather than a thrusting individual himself. And I think it's possible to argue that, to some degree, at, at a time of crisis, he was a natural, almost not quite make weight, but a natural mm. compromise rather than you know, the different, perhaps more charismatic characters in, in within the cabinet who might each have seen themselves as the appropriate uh, holder of the crown. That was the voice of Unit and a Halpin there. John Regan, your view of that? Well, I think if we look at Cosgrave's election, I think what we're actually witnessing is a reaction to Collins' leadership. As in any election, it's important who they don't elect as, as much as who they do elect, and they decide not to go for a flamboyant character, not to go for an army officer, not to go for a charismatic leader. And I think these are all reactions against Collins' charismatic, authoritarian leadership. Um, I think it's a reaction against the authoritarian, even dictatorial road that Collins had been uh, going towards up until his death on the 22nd of, of August. And so if we look at Cosgrave's election, we're looking at it within the context of a reaction to that, the establishment of joint cabinet responsibility, um, and in essence a reaction against the militarist wing within the Treaty 8 regime. And another answer to the question, this time from W.T. Cosgrave's son, Liam Cosgrave, who told me in this interview his father's own opinion on why he had been chosen as leader. Well, I, I, I asked him once how did he come to be selected, and he said that uh, he looked around him at the time and it happened that he was older than most of his uh, colleagues that he had a longer public experience because he'd been a member of the Dublin Corporation from uh, 1909 and was chairman of the Finance Committee which gave him considerable administrative experience that in the circumstances uh, while he did not aspire either then or at any other time to uh, any particular office he felt that it was a duty that devolved upon him and in that spirit he accepted it. He didn't want it at all. John A. Costello. He was quite prepared to do the job when he had to do it. He'd never made the slightest grumble or gross or growl about having to do the job, however difficult it was. He did it, but the one thing he would be, would be extremely glad, if anybody would come along ambition it, if they wanted, they could have it for the asking. And he had certainly no, no desire at all for political performance for himself, and no ambition for himself in the way of personal advancement. That was, I think, one of his clearly, clearly outstanding qualities. The rights and liberties secured by the treaty must be preserved. The fullest possible advantage must be taken of our membership of the British Commonwealth of Nations and of our proximity to the British market. I remember a phrase that was used about a great American. Patrick McGilligan. That his character presided upon events. Uh, I think the meaning there to be that he swayed and moulded the events by the force of his personality. I found that he was a very useful member of the government with plenty of knowledge and plenty of common sense and, of course, a very humane outlook on every aspect of public affairs. I think that was one of the first things that, that uh, impressed me about him was that he had the, the truly Christian outlook on all these things. I used the expression simple frequently about him. His sometime Attorney General, John A. Costello. He was anything but simple in the ordinary sense because he had a depth uh, which uh, would surprise people in many ways. But I found that he had uh, two of the things perhaps that stuck me part altogether from his achievements in public life 
where his geniality and his sense of humor and his capacity for making conversation. In the 1920s, he faced everything that came. Richard Mulcahy. In the same fearless way uh, as he faced his entry into the Rising. To a greater extent, perhaps, they were more unexpected, as far as he was concerned, than was the Rising. The Rising was unexpected to all of us, and no doubt to Mr. Cosgrove, but he to think that he ever thought that he would have to face the difficulties of August 1922, after the death of Griffith and of Collins, could never have entered into his mind. And that the difficulties he faced at that particular time were really greater than he might feel could be faced even with Griffith and Collins there. The government party is the one party in this country which can secure for the people political and economic salvation. I was a very intimate friend of his for the whole period. Michael Hayes. From 1922 onwards. He had left school from the Christian Brothers in Francis Street at the age of little over 14, but had read steadily and constantly after that. And up to the day of his death, was still reading and still interested in history, in particular about Dublin. He knew almost everything that was to be known about the history of Dublin, about its city council and its powers, about its streets and its buildings and its people. He had studied the 18th century particularly well. I wish I had words of sufficient command to express all I know about Mr. Cosgrove as a man, as an Irishman, as a patriot and a soldier. General Sean McKeown speaking 50 years ago on the night that W.T. Cosgrave died. Mr. Cosgrove was gifted by God with very great qualities. He had the qualities of patience, charity, kindness, meekness, unselfishness, and above all, a sense of fair play to every section of the people without distinction of creed or class or politics. It must be remembered that uh, his cabinet was, were, was composed of a large number of men, of 12 men, of very high quality. And it, I'm sure that leadership in that was not an easy matter, but yet he succeeded in doing that extremely well. And um, if I might point out that in his whole handling of every situation, he was always on the side of time, have patience, wait, just don't rush anything, but at the same time when the decision had to be taken and taken, he could carry it out with firmness, with tolerance and with, I think, all the virtues that an Irishman should have. I had from the beginning a very high opinion of Mr. Cosgrave. He was a man of practical uh, of a very practical outlook who took a common sense view of everything and who was never afraid to voice an unpopular opinion and yet was never cranky or never inclined to be uh, merely controversial but uh, uh, stated his views uh, reasonably and stood his ground when it was necessary to stand it. The last few days of the general election were, of course, very much more interesting than the earlier days. The meetings were sometimes late, there were bonfires, there was great enthusiasm. But in any case, the contest has taught us to consider all the points that were at issue in the, in the election, and I think that people generally will be satisfied with the result. We knew that the country could never come to normality as long as the representatives of a large section of the population stayed outside the parliament. And we, I certainly, I, I'm sure of the, this about Mr. Cosgrave, that he regarded the ultimate defeat of our party as part of the business of normalizing the country. <laughs> The programme of Fianna Foyle has now been definitely adopted as the national policy of the Irish people. 
Some consider Cosgrave's greatest achievement was his acceptance that within nine years of the Civil War, the losers in such a war could politically win power through the ballot box. To him, I think, is due a great deal of the credit of the position which the Doyle now occupies. Michael Hayes. He believed from the very beginning that provision should be made for the opponents of the treaty and of his government who did not recognise the state. He felt that no normal parliamentary life could take place in the country until these people all recognised the authority of the Doyle. He was aware, of course, that their entry into the Doyle might be harmful to the interests of his party, but he was much more interested in the country than he was in his party. And his conduct of the Doyle as president through the, through the whole of his ten years made, it seems to me, a vital contribution to the establishment of normal parliamentary life in this country. And this opinion is echoed in this retrospective programme by historians. Here's Eunan O'Halpin. He held the thing together from the start. He came to power at a time of acute crisis. Uh, he, he not only saw through the Civil War the building of the state from nothing, and a state which by and large had a high degree of public integrity, uh, and across a wide range of things, he, he, I think he, he built a monument to himself in this perhaps underachieving, as it was, uh, Irish state. And if you look at the, perhaps the best tribute to Cosgrave was paid when Cosgrave died was by Sean Lamass who was hardly uh, of his, the same political persuasion, but he made a very moving uh, tribute uh, in the Doyle to, to, uh, to Cosgrave, and very magnanimous, uh, in a sense quite unlike what the reaction of Fine Gael when, uh, when Amy de Valera died. I think if I were to uh, identify two genuine achievements by Cosgrave... Mary Daly. The first one I would say is getting Fianna Fáil into the Dáil, giving them the face-saving formula to come into the Dáil and to act as a democratic opposition in 1927, knowing that by doing it he was probably ultimately ensuring that he would leave office. And secondly, one that Morris Manning mentioned briefly, uh, putting in place an apolitical public service. Uh, there are umpteen quotations by him uh, from an early mm. stage that he didn't want an American spoiled system, and I think we owe him an immense uh, vote of gratitude for that. Tom Garvin. My own impression of Cosgrove is that the qu under the quiet exterior and under this slightly unglamorous uh, general persona that he, he had was he had an extraordinary toughness, mm -hmm. what uh, one witness described as a fathomless ferocity which could be aroused when he felt that he was on the right side and when he ha that he would have to be tough. He belonged to that rare company of men whose word was better than his bond. We'll leave the last word with James Dillon, who always emphasised these attributes in W.T. Cosgrave. If he gave you his word in respect of any matter, you would always feel constrained to perform what you understood him to undertake. And that's a quality that you don't find very frequently anywhere. And so I'd sum him up in my memory by saying that he was, in fact, as nearly perfect a Christian gentleman as I have ever known. James Dillon concluding that feature on W.T. Cosgrave to mark the 50th anniversary of his death, which falls tomorrow.